Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. to talk to you today about one of my favorite subjects, uh, probably my most favorite subject, uh, and that is dark matter. And so we're going to have a dark matter hunter's guide to the universe, uh, or I should say to the galaxy is what I say here, and, and it's an obvious uh, allusion to the, the, the hitchhiker's guide, which many of you know, but I think the Hitchhiker's Guide sort of undershot and wasn't ambitious enough because what we need to look for dark matter is actually a, a guide to the universe. That the things that we're learning about dark matter are really on the largest scales. There are something like 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 galaxies like our own in the universe. And so we need to look at the universe in the largest scales in order to learn about what the dark matter is. And unlike the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answer to what is the nature of the dark matter is not 42. <laughs> it's going to be something I think ultimately more satisfying than 42. Uh, and in fact, what we're hoping for at the end of this, at the end of our, our search for dark matter, is to have a complete theory of what the dark matter is. As Myron said, all we know about the dark matter right now is that uh, it's dark and matter. It's not totally true. We, we know a few other things like it's highly non-relativistic and we can put constraints on its interactions. But it's still a big mystery for us. And for uh, a problem solver and a, a mystery seeker, it's a great problem to be working on. So let me start with the view of the night sky. So if you just go out someplace where uh, there's not a lot of city lights. Say you go to Death Valley National Park and you take a look up on the sky. This is an image from, from NASA, actually, of, the, of our Milky Way galaxy. What you see is a lot of light. You see uh, lots of stars in our galaxy. There's probably something like 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 stars. Uh, the sun is a fairly average star. And by looking up on the sky, that would lead you to think that, uh, that the universe is really all about stars. However, we know by experience in science that appearances can really be deceiving. So I, to start this talk, I just want to make uh, a, an analogy uh, with uh, Copernicus. So before the Copernican revolution, we had this view of the universe where the uh, Earth was at the center and uh, all the planets uh, and the sun included, uh, revolved around the Earth. Now, as the measurements of the motions of the planets became more and more precise, the theory which would tell you about the motions of the planets had to become more and more complex. So as the measurements before became more complex, not only was there the cycle around the Earth, but there were all these little epicycles that had to be introduced. In fact, this is the, the origin of this use of epicycles when you say something is complicated. And in fact, the end result was that the universe looked complicated. On the other hand, once Copernicus came into the picture, our picture of the universe changed. Instead, everything moved around the sun. We could do away with all these epicycles, and everything reduced to one simple law. You replace these complicated epicycles picture with a heliocentric view which was governed by one equation, namely Newton's law. So the result was a simplification of our understanding of the universe, but the cost was that we were no longer at the center of the motion of the planets and of the sun. Now, there's some sense in which we're in a similar situation with respect to dark matter. So here's a view of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. So the disk, uh, the galaxy is a, is a disk of stars, so we're looking at it from the top. 
And the sun, uh, which is a rather average star, sits out from the center of the Milky Way galaxy about 26,000 light years. 26,000 light years is a really long way. It's, uh, a light year is about 10 to the 16 meters. And we're whipping around so that we have a circular motion around the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which is about 250 kilometers per second. Now, if we back out from this even further, and we look, this is just the visible matter. Now, if we put this in the context of dark matter, this disk in which we're rotating around the center, so now we've gone from looking at the Milky Way from the top to looking at it from the side. In fact, the stars, which mostly reside in this disk, are surrounded by a dark halo. Now, here it's represented by shading. You can't actually see this with your eyes. So the claim uh, is that, in fact, the entire dynamics of our Milky Way gal galaxy is not dominated by what we can see with our eyes. It's dominated by this dark matter that surrounds everything in our galaxy. And in fact, by extension, not only is there a lot of dark matter in, their ga in the galaxy, there's actually dark matter in this room. Uh, in fact, we live in a dark matter fog. So we know that the local density of dark matter is about 0.1 GeV per centimeter cubed. That's about 0.1 prot protons per, per cubic centimeter. So to compare, um, Earth densities is about 5 grams per centimeter cubed. It's about 10 to the 25 times higher than dark matter. So in this room, there is dark matter, but in comparison to the density of ordinary matter, it's tiny. It's, it's almost negligible. So I said, though, before that uh, the dynamics in the universe is actually dominated by dark matter and not by ordinary matter like us. Uh, and the reason for that is that we are in an extremely unusual place. The Earth uh, is extremely rich in ordinary matter in comparison to the universe at large. And in fact, the measurements that we've been able to make give a picture that looked more like this. Now, this is a, a pie chart of all the matter and energy in the universe at the epoch of the cosmic microwave background. So this is when the universe is actually much younger than it is now. Uh, and what you can see is that ordinary matter, like us, atoms, is about 12% of the pie. And dark matter is about five times more prevalent. And then there are um, other particles, which are important, um, more important earlier in the universe. They're actually a very small fraction of the pie today. But nevertheless, they're neutrinos and photons, and we have a theory to describe them. So we're left with this situation where all of physics is described over here, and there's some other form of matter which is exotic. It's alien. It's otherworldly. It's, you know, you could come up with any number of sensational words to describe it. To say it in uh, scientific terms, we don't have a theory to describe it. The, the uh, tools of physics that we've developed so far to describe ordinary matter, all of the work, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that we've put into physics to understand uh, the basic interactions of, of matter don't describe what's in this slice of the pie. Now, when I say we're looking for a theory, what do I, I mean by that? Well, it's really an analog with what we've learned about the ordinary matter slice of the pie. So uh, in particle physics, we have what's called the standard model of particle physics. And it describes extremely well the interactions of all the ordinary matter, of protons, neutrons, electrons, and the way that they interact with each other. So basically, um, atoms, which are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. The protons and neutrons are made up of, of quarks. There are six quarks. The proton, for example, is two up quarks and a down quark. And these quarks are held together by uh, forces. So the one that holds together the proton is the gluon. And there are other photons, for example, the uh, photon, which allows us to see each other, is a, is a force mediator. There are uh, nuclear forces. And then there are the leptons, uh, the electron, mu, tau, and then the neutrinos that go along with them. 
Bottom line, I'm not going to go into, th this is a beautiful theory, math mathematically very well described theory. I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the point is that we've learned an exquisite amount of detail about this. On the other hand, it only describes this part of the pie. The rest of what's sitting over here in the dark matter sector is really unknown. And if you're a physicist and a dark matter hunter, you actually get very excited by this because this looks like a fantastic problem just waiting to be solved. So coming back then to the analogy that I made earlier, it's similar to the Copernican shift in the sense that positing the existence of dark matter has allowed us to greatly simplify our understanding of the observations. In fact, when you just put in dark matter along with ordinary matter, all the observations suddenly make sense. They all fit together beautifully into a coherent picture. So the cost, though, in this case, if you want to call it a cost, you could also look at it as an opportunity, is that uh, ordinary matter like us really just is not that important for the dynamics of the formation of structure in our universe. Our galaxy, for the most part, the way it behaves on large scales doesn't care about ordinary matter like us. What it cares about, what causes structure to form in it the way it does, is the dark matter. And, uh, and so it's extremely important from the point of view of having a simple understanding and explaining all the um, observations, but then we're left with the big mystery of what is the nature of the dark matter and what is the theory that describes it. So what I'm going to spend this talk on is going into these uh, claims in more detail. So the first claim uh, is that dark matter dominates the structure in the universe. And I want to go through the evidence that we have for dark matter. I said that it's all around us, that it's about a ratio of five to one. I want to tell you how it is that we know that. Then the second claim is that um, dark matter isn't described by any known theory. So the first thing that you might try once, you discuss, once you've discovered that there's a lot of non-luminous matter is that maybe it's just ordinary matter, like us, atoms, that just happen to be dark. So how is it that I know that it's not protons, neutrons, electrons, or anything that exists in the standard model of particle physics? It has to be something new. So I want to tell you about uh, how we know that the dark matter is not described by any known theory, and by extension, how do we identify the nature of the dark matter? So before I go further, I want to uh, elucidate a term that I'm going to be using uh, quite frequently, namely our universe. Uh, what is it that I mean by our universe? Well, our universe doesn't mean that space just ends at the end of the universe. When I say our universe, I actually mean all of space that could have communicated with us over the age of the universe. Uh, and we know that the universe is uh, quite close to 13.8 billion years old. We have very good measurements of that now, thanks to uh, some uh, uh, measurements that I'll talk about later. Uh, and so because information can't propagate from one point to the other faster than the speed of light, that means that the size of the universe is approximately 13.8 billion years. Now, when you do the calculation properly, you come up with a factor of few different answer. And I wouldn't be happy if one of my students gave this answer on one of their exams. But between friends here, 13.8 billion years is about the size, 13.8 billion light years is about the size of the universe. Okay, so to put that back in terms of a perspective, uh, it's about 530,000 times bigger than the distance of us to the center of the galaxy, which was 26,000 light years. So the universe is an extremely big place, and yet my claim is that cosmological measurements have allowed us to get very precise information about dark matter on scales, which are the universe, which is why I was saying that the hitchhiker was being uh, not ambitious enough in restricting uh, himself to the uh, galaxy. So let's talk about the evidence for dark matter. So this is the, the one that is the most well-known. 
and it is uh, the galactic rotation curves. So uh, the basic idea behind all of these uh, measurements of dark matter is that gravity allows us on very large scales to weigh dark matter. So here uh, I have the Milky Way galaxy again, and the basic point is that we have two ways using the speed of stars around the center of some galaxy uh, to measure the amount of matter that is there. So for uh, the first one, I'd like to ask for someone who doesn't get too dizzy. Please. <laughs> Anyone? All right, great. All right, now do you think you can hold these? Yeah, I can. Yeah, all right. I'm not too heavy. Yes. Can you put your arms out? Out. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> what we want to demonstrate here is how we can infer from how fast something is spinning what the mass distribution is. Okay, so this is, this is just the consequence of angular momentum. So if I spin you, now bring your arms in. Bring your arms in. As you bring your arms in, conservation, now put them out again. Put them out. Bring them in. Give you another spin. <laughs> out. In. You can keep going. This is conservation of angular momentum. So what this tells you is that how fast something is spinning <laughs> combined with, <laughs> and you can just keep going. <laughs> combined. <laughs> Thank you very much. Are you dizzy? <laughs> Thank you very much. So that uh, tells you that how fast you're spinning, which is uh, conservation of angular momentum along with Newton's law of gravity, which is extremely well tested, by now actually allows you to infer what the mass distribution is. So that's what you do. You go and you measure the speed of stars moving around the center of the galaxy, and then you combine that with Newton's law and you're able to actually get a measurement of the mass distribution. There's a second way of getting a, a measurement of how much mass there is in stars. So stars by now are uh, very well uh, understood objects. And so if you look at a galaxy and you see how bright it is, you can actually have a very good estimate of how much mass is present in the form of stars. So bottom line, you have two separate uh, measurements of the uh, amount of mass there is in this galaxy. Now you would think, if I understood everything, that one and two should agree. But one and two don't agree. So that tells you that there is something that is missing, uh, namely that there's a lot of mass which is not luminous. So to, to make this more precise, so there were a lot of measurements that was, were done of this by Vera Rubin, uh, so you can do a measurement, then, this was number two, of the velocity one would infer from the luminosity, which is to say from the uh, amount of, of light that is coming from the stars. And you would infer a velocity of the stars as a function of the distance from the center that looks like curve A. And instead, what they actually observed was curve B. And so what that's telling you is that all of the mass is not in these luminous stars. Otherwise, the stars would be moving faster than what's actually observed. This was the first evidence for dark matter. Now, people for a very long time, uh, the first measurements of this was actually made in the 1930s. For a very long time, people were very skeptical of this. Uh, and it's really only been in the last 15 years that the last uh, skeptics have sort of begun to fall one by one. So let's go through a couple of other uh, evidence for uh, dark matter. So let's look at the so-called bullet cluster. Uh, you can see, I, I hope, why this is called the bullet cluster. So what you have is two clusters. Uh, you can see the blob of one here and the blob of the other. This is actually where the mass resides, is where the two blobs are. And then uh, the lit up colors here is the gas. So this is the ordinary matter. Uh, these are the atoms here. 
And you can see that what happened is these two clusters of galaxies came by each other. And when they did that, the ordinary matter, uh, because it interacts, was actually stripped off from one into the other. And so that's why you end up with this uh, bullet-like shape. Now, the next question you should ask, well, there's no stars here. So how is it that I know that the mass of these um, objects is here? And that we can infer because we know from Einstein's theory of general relativity that gravity actually bends light. And you can use the bending of light around these supermassive objects to infer how much mass is there. So we're going to uh, look at how this works. We're going to we have another demonstration of this here. And uh, if you're wondering what we might be doing here, you can just pretend that we're throwing basketballs. And uh, so what we're going to do is one of these objects is like the center of the, one of those two clusters in the picture. And now uh, what we're going to do is these marbles here represent photons which are passing by this massive object. And so if I, uh, you're just going to measure where this goes. Let's see if I can. You can actually mark with a piece of tape how these photons get deflected because space-time itself bends as the objects go around. So the fact that there is this massive object bends space such that the, the photons don't go in the same direction that they would have been before. Now, if I put an even heavier object down, you can see the difference of what happens. Now we're going to mark it. Monica is going to mark it again with a piece of tape. And you can see the fact that I have a massive object actually bends these marbles, which are representing photons even more. And this is exactly how gravitational lensing works. So from how much the photons bend as they go around uh, this massive object allows you to infer how heavy the object is that they're going around. So you see, um, to give you, thanks, um, to give you um, another picture of how this works, if we could um, turn on this screen over here, that would be great. Thank you. All right, so the way this actually looks, so uh, Monica in the demo lab uh, came up with a, the bottom of, a, um, of a, a, a wine glass. So the idea then of, of a gravitational lens is that the object itself will actually bend the light as it goes around the object. So what they actually see in uh, strong gravitational lensing experiments is they see these arcs appear around the object that you're looking at. And this, of course, is an exaggerated version of what they actually see. But you can make very precise measurements of the mass distribution of these objects using uh, this technique of the fact that light bends around uh, massive objects. And so as a result, what they're able to do then, uh, great. OK, thank you. I could almost give the excuse of being a theorist, except it doesn't <laughs> totally work. OK, so what they're able to infer then by using Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity is that uh, the center of mass of these objects then sits where the ordinary matter, which is luminous here, is not. And so that uh, is another piece of evidence that there is a form of non-interacting dark matter that is, in fact, dominating the structure of the, these uh, clusters of galaxies. The um, next piece of evidence, so we're going actually to larger and larger scales. I started with a galaxy like the Milky Way. Then I said, well, there are collections of these objects called clusters of galaxies. And now let's look at the whole universe itself. So this is a picture of uh, low energy microwave photons. So this is called the cosmic microwave background. 
there was beautiful new data that was released just a, a, a couple of weeks ago by the European Space Administration. And what this uh, picture is, is fluctuations in these extremely cold photons. These photons are relics from the Big Bang. And so a red spot here is an upward fluctuation in the temperature of the photons, which is about one part in 10 to the 5. Likewise, a blue spot is a downward fluctuation, which is about one part in 10 to the 5. This background is extremely, extremely uniform. And there are these tiny variations, which are one part in 100,000. So these, why would we be interested in one part in 100,000 temperature fluctuations in some really cold photons in the cosmic microwave background? Don't we have anything better to do with our time? <laughs> and uh, the answer to this is that this is actually the fossil record that shows how our universe looked when it was just 370,000 years old. So given the fact that our universe is 13.8 billion years old today, the fact that we have a direct piece relic of what the universe looked like when it was 370,000 years old is remarkable. And in fact, what it allows us to do is to pick up these one part in 100,000 variations, and then we use powerful computer simulations to evolve those fluctuations using just gravity. So well-known theory, uh, general relativity, and we just evolve them forward using uh, a computer simulation. Actually, in fact, what these computer simulations use is Newton's law and a, a powerful computer. And the result of doing that calculation of picking up the um, cosmic microwave background, and if I can find my cursor, I can run this video, further proving my situation as a theorist. Okay. So at the end result of that, so let's press play here, is you end up with a universe that looks like this. So you find now, instead of variations that are one part in 10 to the 5, variations in the density now after waiting a few billion years that are uh, large. And in fact, if you picked up one of these little objects, they look exactly like our Milky Way galaxy. So these one part in 100,000 variations from when the universe was 370,000 years old actually grow into our galaxy. And that's the reason why we're interested in it, is it allows us to learn in detail about the matter and energy in the universe when it was very young and actually before astrophysical objects like stars or like us come into the picture and complicate things greatly. We like to be able to simplify things so that we can get precise measurements. <coughs> uh, and in fact, here what they're showing is, is a cluster of galaxies. One of these, uh, one of these would, be, um, would be like the Milky Way. So what we have then at the end of this is we can go and compare that simulation against observations. So using a very powerful um, Earth-based telescope, you can actually map out the distribution of galaxies over the universe. And this is a picture of what that looks like from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So here we are at the center, at the corner of the wedge here in the bottom. And you can look out over the universe and look at the structure and see uh, all of these galaxies that are forming from those one part in 100,000 variations in these cosmic microwave background photons. Uh, and in fact, what we can do is compare our theory against uh, the cosmic microwave background and what we observe on the sky today. And we find that everything fits beautifully if we uh, accept this situation where uh, ordinary matter is a really subdominant component of the total matter and energy in the universe. So the conclusion then that we have from all of this is that we can weigh dark matter. Uh, and its weight over the size of the universe is about uh, one proton per cubic meter. Now, ordinary matter is down from that by a factor of five, which also tells you how unusual a place Earth is. But that, of course, is highly unsatisfactory. It would be as if I just took this table, 
forget you knew that the table was here to start with. I put a box around it. I brought in some giant scale. The demo lab was very helpful in setting that up. And then we weighed this table and said it weighs however much it weighs. And then we stopped our scientific investigation and said, we're happy to know what the weight of this table is. Or we wouldn't know what was actually in the box. We would call it uh, missing matter or something. So that's exactly the analogous situation to what we have today. We know how much of the dark matter there is in the universe, but that's all we know about it. What else do we want to know about it? We want to know its mass. We'd like to know what its interactions are. We know that it doesn't interact with the photon, otherwise it wouldn't be dark matter. And in fact, you can put very precise constraints on how strong the interaction with the photon can be. We'd like to know uh, whether the dark matter sector is simple, whether there's only one type of dark matter particle. Are there dark forces? And uh, you'd like to know, <laughs> in fact, <laughs> exaggerating things just a bit, whether uh, <laughs> there could be some secret world which is really just the statement that we'd like to know, well, how, how much does the dark matter sector sort of mirror the kinds of structure that there is in the visible universe? Does this dark matter form into atoms, for, uh, for example? In short, we'd really like a, a theory of dark matter, which is what theorists like me are really interested in, in writing down. So why is it so hard to learn about dark matter? Uh, because, after all, there's dark matter in this room. It's pretty rare. Uh, bottom line, it, it rarely interacts with us. And the reason why we've been able to learn anything about it at all is because we're good at making use of gravitational coherence. The fact that if I get 10 to the 14 times the, the sun's mass together into a cluster, you can really see some things. Uh, on the other hand, if I want to pick up any individual particle, from this cluster of galaxies that we know almost nothing about. So we want to be able to go from the macroscopic observations to have an actual microscopic theory of how dark matter behaves. So you know, thinking about a secret world, a dark matter world, the fact that there is this mirror sector uh, that exists might lead you to ask the question, well, is this, have I just been telling you a fairy tale? And we know another example of this, uh, and that is neutrinos. So neutrinos are produced in the center of the sun in mass. So the sun is a, a nuclear reactor. It takes hydrogen and uh, fuses it all the way up to, um, uh, it ends at iron, and that's when stars die, is when they uh, form the most stable nucleus. And in that process of, of uh, fusing, um, atoms together, they actually produce a, a, a lot of neutrinos. And there are about 65 uh, billion neutrinos from the sun that pass through each square centimeter here on Earth. So there are a massive number of neutrinos from the sun that are passing through us right now. And yet, it still takes absolutely heroic efforts to actually detect these neutrinos. So for example, here is a, a little boat with a guy in it. Uh, on this vast sea of water, and these are all photomultiplier tubes. Uh, and so what you do in these experiments is to fill a giant tank with ultra-pure water, and then look for an occasional wimpy neutrino that comes along and interacts with the water, and then you look from the for the light that comes from that interaction. So this really requires heroic efforts to actually get precise measurements of the neutrinos from the sun. So there's an example of uh, very abundant particles that are going through us all the time, and of course, we don't notice each other. So let me give you an, ana uh, an analogy to mountain peaks. Uh, I love mountains, and uh, here we can think of mountain peaks as being energy. So if on the y-axis I have energy, on the x-axis I have inaccessibility, so we, are pretty low energy, but we're highly accessible. The dark matter sector, on the other hand, is sitting over here. It's highly inaccessible to us. And we don't know what uh, mass the particles are, so we don't actually know what height the, uh, the dark matter sector is on the right-hand side here. And so in order to get information about the dark matter sector, somehow we have to communicate through 
this mountain barrier. Now, there are two ways you can communicate through the mountain barrier. You can just go up over the top of the mountain barrier. And once you're up on the top, you're free to have a look and see what might be over in the dark matter sector. It could be some fantastically beautiful structure. I'm exaggerating a bit here, but you don't know what you're going to find when you get up to the top of the dark matter peak. On the other hand, you could also imagine just sort of tunneling through this barrier and looking for very rare types of process that allow you to probe the dark matter sector, which is over on the other side. So that tells us then about ways that we might try to look for dark matter. So the first way is that you can try to tunnel through that barrier. And tunneling through that barrier means that you look for very rare interactions. And there are two primary ways that we look for very rare interactions of dark matter. First of all, dark matter can scatter off of nuclei. Uh, and you have to build very particular types of detectors in order to be able to detect that, because it is a very rare process. The other thing that you can do is to look for very rare dark matter annihilations in the galaxy. And to do that, you want to obviously point your detector in a direction where dark matter density is very high, uh, which is typically not here. The second way, uh, general category, is a little bit more brute force, which is just head straight up the mountain. And really, this is what particle uh, colliders do, like the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. What they do is to smash, uh, for example, protons together at very high energies. Then you can excite massive states. And when you do that, you may happen to land at the top of the mountain that allows you to look over into the next valley and see whether the dark matter is there. So I want to go into more detail about each of these three ways of looking for dark matter. So first of all, rare scattering of dark matter. So the reason why these experiments are hard is because you have a large background. So for example, we know that uh, there are cosmic rays uh, that produce a lot of radiation. This is the reason why when you go to a, a high altitude, you get more radiation than you would normally. You have cosmic rays which are produced by astrophysical objects that go slamming into our atmosphere. Our atmosphere does a good job of protecting us from these cosmic rays. But they produce these highly energetic particles that shower down towards us and produce some level of radiation. That is going to completely ruin your ability to be able to find a rare dark matter scattering off of a nucleus. So what you do to protect yourself from this, and this is part of the heroic efforts that physicists make to learn about the universe, is you put it underground. You literally go into a mine, and you put a dark matter detector underground, and you try to shield yourself from the cosmic rays that way. So for example, there's an experiment that lives in the Sudan mine in northern Minnesota. There are some very dedicated grad students going there in January to northern Minnesota. This is the coldest part of the country to work on their experiment underground. And they literally, by the way, I am from Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> so they, uh, they actually put a clean room underground in the mine. So here is a picture of someone working on the CDMS experiment. You can see that they're in, uh, this is the uh, cryogenic dark matter search. Uh, and they're in a, uh, in a clean room here. And not only do you have to worry then you've removed the background from the cosmic rays, but then you also have to worry about radioactivity uh, coming from the rock. So you ha usually have to build shielding around it. And then you have to have some um, way of rejecting your background from your signal. So what they look for is a dark matter particle here, represented by WIMP, weakly interacting massive particles, uh, that come in. And they interact with a nucleus. The nucleus goes recoiling off. It produces some um, energy, heat, which is phonons, some free electrons. And then you detect those. Uh, and then the dark matter goes on its way. And you try to separate what your signal would look like from the, from the background. And these have been shown to be very efficient at so far setting limits on uh, dark matter scattering off of nuclei. You can also look, uh, going on to the second method of looking for dark matter through rare processes, you can look for dark matter annihilation. So here I have a cartoon of two dark matter particles coming in. There's some type of interaction. 
and then they spit off ordinary uh, standard model particles, whether those be quarks or leptons or the force mediators, and eventually what you get downstream are particles that we can detect, electrons, protons, or photons. Now, if you're going to look for dark matter annihilating in the galaxy, you should look someplace where there's a lot of it. And the place where there is the most dark matter, say, in our galaxy is actually in the center of the galaxy. So picking up an image from uh, one of these simulations, uh, the center of the galaxy now in dark matter is going to have a much, much higher density of dark matter than there is here. And so what can happen, because you have so much dark matter concentrated in the center of the galaxy, where the dark matter has sunk, once it's there, it can start to annihilate. So if you have, uh, say, a satellite, just say a billion or two floating around, thanks to NASA, you can um, put one of these objects up into the sky and look for this. In fact, these detectors, these satellites, are typically not solely devoted to looking for dark matter. They're typically uh, multi-pronged experiments looking for many different types of science. But one thing that they can do is to look for dark matter annihilation. So what does dark matter actually look like, say, in, in high energy photons, high energy photons being gamma rays? Well, uh, here is a picture of it, it basically looks like a feature, a sharply rising and then falling feature. Uh, so here is the uh, rate of float photons on the vertical axis. Here is the energy of the photons. And the only thing that I wanted to point out to you here is that there's a feature here. And in fact, this caused a lot of uh, excitement in the community in the, um, within the last year when people were speculating about whether this bump in the photon spectrum of Fermi uh, could actually be due to dark matter. After having gone through several rounds of reanalysis of this data, the consensus of, this commu of the community is that it's probably not due to dark matter. But you can see how there can be a lot of excitement that arises when there's a possible hint, and then there's more investigation, people push on it, and then in most cases up to this point, the, the community comes to the consensus that it's probably not due to dark matter. You can also look for uh, dark matter in charged particles. So we just talked about photons, very high energy photons. You can look for dark matter in charged particles, protons and electrons. This is different than looking for photons because charged particles in the galactic magnetic field and the fact that there are so many other charged particles around don't point anywhere. They just sort of random walk. They random walk. You produce them somewhere. So here's the, the plane of the galaxy. And uh, we're sitting somewhere out here. And dark matter will annihilate somewhere in the neighborhood. And then it'll random walk towards us. Uh, and we can look for an excess of electrons and positrons. And recently, actually just this week, there was data that was announced from the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which in this left image here is uh, shown uh, docked on the International Space Station. That's where it lived. Uh, it was an experiment which was built at CERN. This is a picture here of Sam Ting, who is a Nobel Prize winner and UM grad. Uh, and uh, here is uh, when the experiment was being built, and then they loaded it on, the, um, uh, on, the, on a NASA um, mission and sent it up, loaded it, and then they released results this week. And what dark matter would look like uh, in an experiment like AMS2, so here is the flux of particles, so this is the rate at which particles are coming into the detector, as a function of the energy, what I want to point out to you, so these are simulated dark matter models, what you see is a dramatic fall off in the rate of particles, uh, charged particles that you would see. Now, what AMS actually saw was a little bit of a cliffhanger. They saw them continue to rise and then sort of flatten off. So basically, what they see is this rise and this flattening. And of course, they don't have enough data yet to be able to say whether this continues to rise or whether it turns over. So we're waiting to see uh, what happens. So the last way that we can uh, look for dark matter, as I said, was to just scale the mountain, to just 
have a high enough energy machine that you can get yourself up to this state and then look to see what might be on the other side. And the way that we do this is by building really big machines that collide particles together at higher and higher energies. So here is a photo from CERN of the Large Hadron Collider. This is uh, the ring. These are the Alps, uh, 27 kilometer ring. And this is what the machine looks like in this red tunnel. It, it really is a, a remarkable engineering feat. The energy in um, the beam is equivalent to an American aircraft carrier at five knots. So, um, so you're really accelerating these proton beams to extremely high energies. And when it turned on in 2008, there was, we, there was a tribute from, uh, from Google. There was some uh, hubbub about whether a black hole might be produced at the Large Hadron Collider and it could eat up the Earth. Uh, none of us working on high energy physics were concerned about that at all. Very precise calculations had been done. And in fact, we're still here. So, um, so these uh, experiments are heroic because you're looking for very precise information about extremely high energy particles. So around the beam line of the LHC, there are two detectors. This is the CMS detector. You can see how big this detector is and how much instrumentation has to be built in order to um, be able to detect that precise information. And uh, what you get out is this um, sort of uh, um, shower of standard model particles that you try to re reconstruct from the shower of particles that came out what actually happened. And so what we're testing, uh, stated in plush toy terms, is the standard model. So some very, some very creative person uh, made these uh, plush toys for all the standard model particles. So there are the, the six quarks here. You can see the neutrinos, because they're so hard to detect, are like bandits. They have their eyes covered. And uh, the photon here is sort of flying along. And uh, what the hubbub has been about recently has been the discovery of the Higgs boson. And it has its own plush toy. And you can see that it's wool felt with gravel fill for uh, maximum mass. <laughs> So what, what they're, so the Higgs boson, of course, is, is what's responsible for the mass of the, of the standard model particles. And uh, even though it's not as heavy as the top quark is one of the, is the uh, second most massive particle that we've discovered. But why am I talking about the Higgs boson in the context of dark matter? Well, what does it mean to see the Higgs boson? Well, we see the Higgs boson actually by its decay products. So the Higgs can go to uh, two of the weak nuclear force uh, mediators, two Z bosons, which then decay to four leptons, two electrons, and two muons. So what that looks like in the detector here is a candidate Higgs event. You can see uh, here the two green lines are representing electrons, and then you have muons coming represented here by the red lines. And you can reconstruct this, and by knowing very precisely what the standard model of particle physics uh, tells you about what the background should be, you can actually extract that this is probably a Higgs boson event. So what does that have to do with dark matter? Well, it turns out that it may have a lot to do with dark matter. We don't know that it does, but it may. And the reason why is that the Higgs boson itself may actually mediate the communication between us and the dark matter particle. So to come back to this mountain analogy, the Higgs boson may, in fact, be one of these two peaks. And in fact, the Higgs boson may be what allows the dark matter sector to communicate directly with us by producing, by scaling the mountain of the Higgs, and then going over on the other side and producing the dark matter directly. So what does that actually look like at, at a collider? So I've just shown you uh, a detector cross-section. So here is an example event. So here I'm looking down. Instead of uh, looking from the top of the detector, I'm just looking directly down the beam pipe. And this is the circular picture uh, of, the, um, of the detector. What dark matter looks like at a collider is missing energy. Okay, so what can happen is you come in, 
and you have a whole bunch of other particles, and then there's nothing. So that's very telling, which we're going to um, do in the last demonstration here, which is probably the one that's most dangerous for a theorist like me. So we'll see whether I can get it right and not electrocute myself. <coughs> okay, so we're going to load up the cannon here. And I want you to look at where this uh, ends up recoiling from. Pull this. This is loading the uh, capacitor. Okay, now we're going to charge it up. This is going to take a little while. So what I want to demonstrate here is how, even if you don't know about what's being thrown the other direction, you can infer from the object that you do see, the thing that's not being thrown, that there was actually something that was thrown. And that's exactly what we're doing at the LHC. And I think I'm going to stop this now before it gets too extreme. All right. So uh, should we do this on the count of three? Yeah, OK. So just watch that pink uh, thing. One, two, three. OK. <laughs> Pretty good pop. So what you can see is that even if I didn't know that the tennis ball was flying over there, let's just uh, make it invisible, that I can infer from, in fact, how far this recoiled that, in fact, that the tennis ball went there. And dark matter is exactly like that. I can't actually see the tennis ball, but I can see what's recoiling from it. And so I can reconstruct that there was energy that went in the other direction. And so that's what we're trying to do at the LHC is to produce dark matter through the Higgs boson and then have this uh, missing energy. So let me uh, just then summarize then what we've, we've gone through. All the methods of dark matter detection are really different sides of the same coin. So we first talked about scattering off of ordinary nuclei. So if I just imagine here I have a diagram that I'm going to use three different ways for the three different detection methods. I have the dark matter particles. I have the ordinary particles here on the right-hand side. Uh, the SM stands for standard model. That's anything in the standard model particle physics. This side is what we understand. This side is what we don't. And we've conveniently put a blob in there to represent what we don't understand. And uh, here, if we go in this direction, dark matter comes in. It scatters off of a nucleus in this case, which is a standard model particle, and comes out. That is the direct detection arrow on the left-hand side. On the other hand, dark matter can come in and it can self-annihilate and produce standard model particles. That's on this side, going this way. That's the indirect detection that we talked about. And lastly, we can have standard model particles, protons, which collide with each other and produce two dark matter particles. And then we can try to detect the dark matter particles through the missing energy at the large at the Large Hadron Collider. So one of the basic things that you should take away from this talk is that a cosmic problem about uh, understanding what the nature of the dark matter is really requires a multifaceted approach. It requires a cosmic approach, not just on the size of the galaxy, but really on the size of the entire universe. We talked about the cosmic microwave background, so the measurements from the Planck satellite, clusters of, of galaxies coming together, uh, the measurement of how structure forms in the universe, uh, looking for dark matter annihilation in the center of our galaxy, looking for dark matter scattering, and then finally just producing it directly at the LHC. And we need all these different probes because we're in this situation that we're really trying to track down what the nature of the dark matter is. And I'm really excited for the next 10 to 15 years to see how our understanding of what the dark matter is. I think in many ways, we may be on the cusp of discovery of what the nature, particle physics nature of the dark matter is. Thanks.
Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.